So welcome to Indianapolis. Thank you. Great to be here. And to 90.1. We're delighted to have you here today. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here supporting the station. Your whirlwind tour right, of Indianapolis. Right, right, right. Indianapolis in and out. You <laughs> have written so many books about women, famous women, famous in their own right women. You are a woman. <laughs> That's true. You notice. <laughs> A lot of those books talk about the relationships between mothers and daughters from the past. When you look at 21st century and what young girls and even young women and even older women are dealing with right now, what kind of message would you want them to take away at this point? Take away from the books or from the from life? From life. Well, I, I don't think that uh, that women are experiencing things one of the reasons I write history books about women is to show that really we've been doing these things forever. Uh, women have been acting the way they act and doing the things they do from time out of mind. The titles might have been different, and the pay was certainly different or non-existent, but the, uh, but the uh, actions were not all that different. And I think that's uh, useful for people because they tend to get uh, very absorbed in their own moment in history and think this is the first time anything's ever happened and they don't know how to deal and all of that stuff. And it just seems to me that it's useful to understand that you know this is not so hard. Of the women that you've written about in, in the past couple of books with, with the, um, the Civil War and even before that, the, the First Ladies, if you could sit down one-on-one -on -one with one of those women, live in person, maybe have a cup of coffee, a little conversation, who, who would that be? It would be different for different things. Um, uh, the founding mothers, the women of the founding period, uh, there are obviously some very interesting people like Abigail Adams, but she would probably be a, a little bit of a tough customer. Um, but there was a woman I wrote about in that period, John Jay's wife, Sarah Livingston Jay, who would be delightful. Uh, she was very funny. Her letters are um, full of politics and very amusing. And and we have her um, we have her menus from her dinner parties. So she gave a good dinner. So she would be somebody you'd want to sit sit next to and and just have a chat with. So different people for different things. And because you've, you've done a lot of research, how, how do you do all that research? It's really hard. Um, you have to find letters and diaries uh, from women who, in many cases, people have not uh, respected that, and so they're not that easy to find. Now, uh, after the first book, After Founding Mothers, it became easier because the people in the historic societies and the library, university libraries and uh, Library of Congress and all of that understood what I was up to and so um, became more helpful. But it's still, it's still often detective work. And then once you finally find this stuff, it is very, very difficult to read uh, 18th or 19th century handwriting where it is written both horizontally and then over it vertically. And so um, I, have to, I actually have to hire people to decipher it. I can't read most of it. Do you have a deadline when the, the book has to be done, or do you set your own deadlines? Well, uh, in the case of Capital Dames, the book that came out in April, the deadline was very uh, explicitly April 15th because that was essentially the end of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. And uh, that was a firm deadline that I was equally uh, desirous of meeting as, as well as the publisher. But it was we had had a we had had a tough year last year in the family, and um, so I was not finished the book until February. So that meant uh, spending January getting up at three in the morning and just writing straight through till six or seven at night. So that was a rough month. And I finally got the book from the library. I've been on the <laughs> waiting list forever, and it showed up yesterday. <laughs> so I'm well, anticipating <laughs> reading it too. Um, so you've obviously researched the lives of many women. Who should be on the $10 bill? You know, I am terrible about uh, answering that. And the reason for that is that when you look at the men on our currency, uh, there really are not women of equal power. And of course, that has to do with the place of women in society and history. I mean, I can make a good case for Dolly Madison, who really held the country together at various times, but nobody would ever go for that. Um, 
I, I, I keep saying, well, you know, maybe you could do somebody like Sandra Day O'Connor, the first justice, female justice, but I think you have to be dead, and I doubt that she's ready to take one for the team. Um, but so I, I really can't come up with a, a good answer here. I guess you can say one of the suffragists. We do have a Susan B. Anthony dollar, and nobody likes it very much. So it's hard to, it's hard to answer that. But I'm delighted to see Alexander Hamilton go. I don't like him a bit. Why not? Because he cheated on his wife and he, um, you know, left her in, in destitute with seven children and, and then went out and stupidly got killed. And he still made it on the <laughs> bill. <laughs> He's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was able to get uh, Claudia Dreyfus's book interview and there's a lovely recollection in there from an interview, I think two interviews she did with you and Nina Totenberg and Linda Wertheimer. And, you guys have kind of all been there with the NPR since the Forever. Uh, well, Linda's been there from the very beginning, uh, and then Nina came shortly thereafter, and I came a couple of years later. But yes, um, and Susan Stamberg as well. So Susan and Linda were both there at the beginning when there were no chairs. But um, it has been a very uh, special thing for us uh, to have that kind of friendship in the workplace and to have that kind of support of each other. Uh, we have been there through all kinds of life's changes, uh, good and bad, and um, it, is, it is very, very important in all of our lives. But we've also learned that it's important to the listeners, and uh, people have gotten so that they like hearing us old, old ladies, um, you know, continuing to be on the radio, and that's a good thing. Now, um, Garrison Keillor, the... Right. Public radio icon finally announced yesterday that he's retired. Oh, he did? He did. I didn't know that. But he said a writer never really retires. That's true. That's true. But there's no need to, um, I guess, unless you start just sort of babbling in your writing. But you, <laughs> there's somebody who can edit the babbling if you're not live on the air. <laughs> so that, that's got its advantages. But um, I think that, that you can write pretty much forever. So no retirement. Oh no, I, I can't imagine. What would I do? You know, I don't know how to do anything else with this. And Garrison's a wonderful writer, and he will he'll continue to write. I mean, look what he writes. It's extraordinary. It, it, but we were all talking about that too. I mean, he literally does write the show. And right, he all writes those the entire show, and, and and it's so clever and so well done. And and then when he puts it between uh, hard covers, it's also beautifully written. So. I've got a couple names I just kind of want to read off and, okay. and see what you, you tell me a little bit about that person, your reaction, how you, how you feel about them. We'll see. Um, <laughs> and since you are the political analyst and since our governor, Mike Pence, has been in the headlines quite a bit lately. Well, he's a very interesting uh, political uh, creature. I mean, I think that he's, he, um, he, was a, he was a leader in Congress and then he uh, came and, and took on the governorship and I think that one of the things that happens to governors, who particularly governors who have been legislators, is that they discover that um, there's an awful lot you just have to do. And you can't just make speeches and be ideological. You have to be practical. And I think that's always a learning curve, and I think he's now on the other side of it. Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. You know, we talk about him endlessly enough. Stop giving him airtime. I wish you know we. Every Monday morning we say, "Oh God, do we have to talk about him again?" And then you do, uh, but it won't be for long. And and how do you guys decide when you and George Stephan when you sit down to figure out? Oh, who for you're Sunday morning. Yeah, for Sunday morning. For Sunday, you mean who's going to be a guest or who's going to be a, a both? Who, who's the guest and how does that all happen? Well, for for guests, it's a much more complicated thing because they they sort of rotate. Uh, and every White House has control over everybody in the administration and all of that. Um, but for the people on the round table, it's usually pretty obvious what you're going to talk about in terms of politics. But, um, but the, if, if somebody has something that they particularly want to talk about, they will tell the producers. Do you prefer being the analyst as opposed to the reporter or pros and cons of both? Well, you know, in radio, you're always kind of both. Uh, you, you say why things are happening as well as that they happened. Uh, what I'm 
What I very, very rarely do is say what I think about it. Um, and, um, and I have the leeway to do that now because my official title is commentator, but, um, but I very rarely do that because I think it's just more comfortable for me to tell you uh, what's happening and why rather than, and I think. Are there, I'm sure there are similarities and differences between working for ABC and NPR? Well, the big difference in my case is just the medium. Um, I, I've certainly never had um, anybody say, in either instance, uh, don't cover that or don't say that or don't do that uh, because we're, we've got uh, corporate money or foundation money or government money or anything like that. So I've never had any, I've never had any editing based on the institution. It's really um, the differences between the medium of television and the medium of radio and the length of time. And we all enjoy hearing your husband on NPR good, too. Good. Diane Rehm retires. Will he take the job? No, I think that they'll probably go younger, but he'd love it. He, he enjoys it a lot, doing it a lot. And has that, both of you being journalists your whole life together, you literally spent your whole life <laughs> met when you were 18 and 19. True. That's incredible. Our whole lives. It's absolutely true. Uh, and the question is? <laughs> both of you being in the same business help hurt? It helps. It definitely helps. Um, first of all, in the era when we were covering Congress every day, uh, we really knew what the other one was doing. Nobody could say, oh, you, you just don't understand. Um, and it was also, frankly, just helpful. You know, you, we, could, we could help each other because we weren't competing. And I could always be on the air before he could be in print. This was before the 24-7 news cycle. And um, uh, the, just the commuting together, all of that was, was very nice. So I think it's, it's been uh, almost entirely a plus. And I know you two both did work early in your careers in life in Greece and lived there for a while. What is that like for you to see all the turmoil that's going on there? Well, it makes you sad because we care about the country a lot, but it doesn't surprise us, <laughs> having lived in Greece and covered Greek politics for almost four years. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful country, um, but it, it does have its complications. And the next book for you? Oh. Are you two going to collaborate? or No. Um, I, Steve, Steve is a, a full professor at George Washington University, and he is a talented teacher and loves it. And he uh, not only you know, spends a huge amount of time on his courses, but he, he um, gets all the kids' jobs and gets them all married and stays in touch with them forever and all of that. Uh, so I think that you know, he really doesn't need to write another book, uh, of a big book at this point. Um, and, um, and I really do like writing about women. And what do you like to read? Well, I like to read, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, I obviously do like to read history. At one point, actually, before I had ever written a book, I said to Steve, I, what I really want to do is just sit around and read history. And he said, nobody's going to pay you to do that. And he was wrong. But I had to write it as well as read it, which was, you know, the little second part is a little harder. But um, I like to read novels. I like to read what anything anybody likes to read, you know. Are you an e-reader or? I, I read a lot on my iPad um, because it's so much easier than carrying around lots of, I live in terror of not having something to read. So I was always carrying 10 books and stuff. So it's nice not to have that weight. What will you be reading on the flight back to Washington? With any luck, I'll be sleeping <laughs> on the flight back to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I actually have a book that I uh, that's not published yet that I have to blurb, and I'll be reading it. How about listening-wise? Are you a podcast person, or do you still listen to NPR on the radio? I listen to NPR stations on my phones, and uh, and I have to tell you, I am a member of any station that I regularly listen to, and I am not only a member, I am a sustaining member of any station that I regularly listen to because I think that that is the only honest thing to do. Can't add much more than that, <laughs> can we? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here.